properties and changes of matter. In the last lecture we talked about um, matter, what matter actually is. You should remember that matter is anything that has mass or anything that occupies space. Typically that we consider two things in the universe, uh, matter and energy. Chemistry deals with studying actually both, but you'll study energy a little more uh, intensely in physics. Now, each substance has a unique set of physical and chemical properties. Now, physical properties are measured or they can be observed without actually changing the substance. So, for example, if we look at it, look at something, we can consider the color, the density, um, an odor, or the melting point. Uh, something else we may be able to consider is the boiling point um, or the volume you know different things like that stuff that when we observe it it's not changing chemical properties however describe how a substance reacts with something or changes to form a different substance for example um, burning or flammability uh, an example that we have um, that we can consider is hydrogen burning with oxygen uh, and it forms a completely new substance you should remember from chemistry one combustion reactions form water um, Properties may be categorized also as either intensive or extensive. So we can have intensive physical properties or intensive chemical properties, or we can consider it even further and have extensive physical properties or extensive chemical properties. Now, an intensive property our intensive properties do not depend on the amount of substance present. For example, if we take the temperature of something, it doesn't matter how big of um a cooking pot we have, if we're taking the temperature of something on the stove, stove, it's going to be the same no matter if you put it in a big pot or a little pot when you're cooking. Um, also, the color. The color's not going to change. If you think of a gold ring, a gold ring still is going to have that yellowish um, tint as well as a big gold bouillon bar. Uh, melting point is also something, or boiling point, those are two things that we can uh, consider as intensive. It doesn't matter if you have a big um, sample or a small sample, the melting point is still going to be the same as well as the density. Uh, intensive physical properties are typically used to identify uh, the composition of a substance. For example, we can identify gold by looking at its density. Gold has a very specific density of around 19.6 grams per milliliter. Now, if we have something else, like for example silver, how can we get, say, how can we dif differentiate between silver painted a goldish color in gold, well we can look at their density. Silver has a density of around 11 point, uh, it, it's around 11. Now, extensive properties do depend on the quantity of the substance present. For example, mass. The more stuff you have, or the more matter you have, the more mass you're going to have, as well as the more space you're going to take up as far as volume. <clears throat> Intensive properties give us an idea of the composition of a substance, whereas extensive properties give an indication of the quantity of that substance. So extensive typically are going to be dealing with more quantitative measurements. Intensive are more qualitative, though we can make a few quantitative observations with intensive or intensive properties. Now let's talk a little bit about physical and chemical changes. We have two types of changes that we talk about. Should from chemistry one physical changes and chemical changes. A physical change is when a substance changes physical appearance without altering the identity. For example, a change of state. If a if you have solid water, we better we more often refer to it as ice, going from solid form to liquid form, just changing into regular old uh, drinking water for example, is the identity of the water changing? Not really. It's still going to be H2O. It's just going from H2O solid form to H2O liquid. For. Uh, another physical change is they change in temperature, which is very closely close related to the phase change. And also a volume. If I have a glass of water, and if I pour more of water into that glass, did anything change chemically? No, it's just the physical amount that was actually there changed. Now, a chemical change, <clears throat> we sometimes refer to it as a chemical reaction, results in a completely new substance, or the substance transforms chemically into different substances. The atoms rearrange in bonding. Uh, for example, the decomposition of water, or the explosion of uh, TNT, that changes the shapes of the molecules. Now, I have a chemical reaction example right here. We have a cylinder of 
hydrogen gas and a cylinder of oxygen gas. You should remember for a combustion reaction, which is what we have here, we have a cutting torch. For a combustion reaction, we must have a uh, fuel, which is what the hydrogen uses, oxygen, and we must provide an ignition source. Remember, oxygen is required for all things to combust. Now, we're taking gaseous hydrogen, gaseous oxygen, mixing it together in this regulator on the uh, cutting torch to get a flame. Now you should remember that a great deal of energy is released when oxygen and hydrogen atoms come together. Well, and also we have a completely new substance made. We have um, water made. So we have a completely new substance being made. Uh, Compounds can be broken down into more elemental particles. This is another example of a chemical reaction or breaking down a compound. We have water molecules and we're actually breaking them back down. So this is kind of a reverse reaction from the previous slide, or is the reverse reaction from the previous slide. We're breaking those compounds down. Remember, a compound is made up of two or more uh, pure substances or two or more elements. We're breaking those compounds down into its simpler, simpler elemental forms. Um. This is referred to as hydrolysis. It's a form of electrolysis, which we will study a bit later. Uh, should notice here that the water molecules, uh, two hydrogen, H2, and then an oxygen, these are called space filling models, by the way, uh, are being bonded together. Then, after an electric current is passed, it decomposes or breaks down into its elemental forms. Now, again, why, is oxygen, why does oxygen have two elements? and also hydrogen have two elements. Well, it has to do with them being um, diatomic. All right, let's talk a little bit about separation of mixtures. The key to separating mixtures or separating things apart, I mean, you know, in chemistry we want to study these changes and specific, sometimes maybe we may want to study a specific portion of a uh, system that we're investigating in lab and that may call for us to separate. The key principle in separating mixtures or separate of separation techniques is to exploit the difference in the properties of the different components. For example, distillation takes advantage of different boiling points. Um, we have salt water in our first flask here. What happens is we boil that water. What happens when you boil water? Well, it turns from a liquid to a gas. That water vapor travels up to the top of this, um, it appears to be a Florence flask, or a distillation flash rather, <clears throat> then it condenses back down into this side outlet. And then it further becomes a liquid by going through this condenser jacket, or what we typically refer to as a Liebig condenser in college. Um, it's cooled by water, so it cools that gas down back into the liquid form and is collected. The pure water is collected. Now, how do we get this set? Why, how, why does the salt stay and the wa liquid water come uh, to the receiving flask? Well, salt has a much higher boiling point than water. You should remember, at room temperature, uh, solid is typically, unless it's in solution, typically going to be a solid. Now, in order to take that from the solid form, we're going to have to take it to the liquid, to the gaseous form, which we're going to talk about phase diagrams. But, salt being an ionic compound, and we're going to talk about um, intermolecular forces a little bit later and bonding, but salt being an ionic compound is going to have a very high boiling point, especially being made of both um, sodium and chloride ions. Okay, so the salt stays behind in the flask, the water is received in the receiving flask. You've probably seen this on like dual survival or some kind of survival show on the Discovery History Channel where they take um, leafy matter and they put it into what's called a solar still. The sun draws the liquid out of the, um, or even salt water they put in there, it draws the, the water vapor or the water out of your um, uh, tainted solution, we'll call it, and then it deposits it onto um, either a plastic film or something, and they typically drink that water that comes from there. It condenses back and they drink it. Another separation technique, which technique which you should remember from chemistry one, is filtration. Filtration removes a solid from a liquid. The solid is left in the top of the uh, funnel or in the filter paper, and the liquid typically goes to the bottom. Now, there are some things that can stay in solution that are can stay in liquid form uh, that we have to consider uh, 
but if you have a solid and a liquid together, we can separate this solid and liquid by uh, the method of filtration. Think about the coffee pot in the morning time. If you make coffee, if you drink coffee, you'll notice that they use a coffee filter to keep those coffee grounds out of the coffee. If you've ever had coffee grounds in your coffee, you know that that can be quite annoying. And a third type of um, separation technique that we talk about typically not a whole lot. As a matter of fact, I did not get a chance to do it last year. It's called chromatography. Chromatography exp exploits the solubility of something or how easy is it to dissolve. Uh, typically your heavier molecules stay towards the bottom. Your lighter ones are wicked up to the top. You see that it is a, a piece of chromatography paper is placed in here. The liquid creeps up. As it creeps up, it takes what's typically ink or some type of um, some type of liquid, takes that ink, and then it separates out the different components with heavier molecules being on bottom. Um, these are a few types of separation techniques. I believe I also talked about uh, centrifugation last year that I, I'm not going to talk about this year. But that's just a few ways, these are just a few ways to separate um, mixtures by their physical properties.